everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today at the Women in Data Science panel event. In case you're not familiar with what Women in Data Science community is, it is a community that was established around five years ago. We run all different types of events, um, including panel type events like the one we're having today. We have workshops at MLATS, we have mentorship programs, tech talks, and so on and so forth. Our mission is to empower women in data related fields to achieve their full potential. If you have not yet, please join our community at aka.ms slash wits, where you can also look for past events recordings at aka.ms slash wits underscore info. For the event today, we're going to have two major parts. The majority of the event will be focusing on panel discussion on pre-collected questions. While we make the announcement of this event, we included a survey where our community members can submit the questions they would like to see being discussed in this event. All of the questions we're going through today are from those surveys. And the last 10 minutes are reserved for open Q&A. So throughout this event, please feel free to publish your questions in the Q&A session in the Teams chat. We'll then answer, we'll then answer those questions in the open Q&A section. In case we don't have enough time to go through all the questions asked, we're going to compile them in an email seeking for answers from the panelists after the event and share back with you with all of you in emails offline. So without further overdue, let me introduce our panelists today. We have three awesome panelists, two internal from um, Gabriela and Sam, and one external from Netflix, Juliet. So our Panelists will be able to introduce themselves better. And so please start in self introduction. And in it, please also include an answer to the ice breaking question. This ice breaking question comes from ChatGPT, because none of the presentations today are complete without mentioning ChatGPT. We fed ChatGPT the backgrounds of all the three awesome panelists' backgrounds and asked it to give us a uh, ice breaking question. The question is, if you could use data science to solve any fictional problem from a movie, TV show, or book, what would it be and how would you approach it? So let's start from Gabriella. Hi, everybody, and thanks for the introduction, Mary. So my name is Gabriella de Quiroz, and I work here at Microsoft as a principal cloud advocate manager. So I manage a team, a global team, and we are focused more on AI, ML, and data science. Um, so we create content, there is a community, uh, we work with different programs such as Student Ambassador, MVP, um, we also work with reactors and different uh, offerings and product groups inside Microsoft. And in terms of like the icebreaker question, oh, one thing that I forgot to mention, yes, of course, a big piece of me, communities. I'm also a uh, founder of All Ladies and AI Inclusive, like two big organizations pretty much involved in my life uh, from 10 years until now. Uh, but the icebreaker question is a great one. And mine is not going to be fictional actually, because I love reality shows. So when I was, when I'm thinking about what kind of like data science I can use, and this is a totally like hypothetical scenario, right? Uh, I, I don't think it's a, it's, a, it's a way to solve with data science, but one show that I've been watching and I'm waiting for the next episodes, it's The Love is Blind. So it's a reality show uh, where, where you have all these different, uh, you know, you have uh, men and women uh, and they communicate through the pods, they don't see each other. And the whole idea is like, is love blind or not? Like, can you fall in love uh, with someone that you've never seen before? And then there is a lot of, of course, drama. And that's the, the beauty of the show. I think it's the drama after that. And this, especially this season was, uh, was filmed in, uh, from people from Seattle. So anyway, so then I was thinking, okay, how can I use data science to help the, the, the people over there? So maybe I could use a model to predict which couples are more likely to stay together and build a successful relationship after the show because it's very hard. So, you know, I would get some data about the couples, like maybe the demo demographic information, some personality traits, some interest, and then see how they interacted dur during the show uh, using some kind of like frequency or maybe their conversation, maybe use sentimental analysis. And then I would, would create this crazy machine learning algorithm to analyze all this data, identify patterns, uh, and then uh, again, use sentiment analysis to analyze the interaction, uh, see if there is any pattern 
on their communication that could predict some kind of like compatibility and likelihood of success. Uh, and then that would help the attendants or like the couples to, especially when they are in the, that place where they are not they are not sure if I should go with this person or the other person, then they could use this model to make more like a data-driven decision. Oh yeah, you know, I'm in doubt. I, I'm not 100% sure. Maybe I should go with this person because the data science or the data is telling me so. Anyway, a good, a good, a good interesting example to think of. Thank you very much. Next, I have Juliet. Uh, well, I love the shout out to Love is Blind. Uh, always appreciate it. I'm Juliet Hoagland. I'm a staff software engineer at Netflix, which creates and shows Love is Blind. Um, this season's a real doozy. I I often get asked if we get a free Netflix working at Netflix. The answer is no, but we do get preview content. And so I've seen the entire season. And all I can say is you're going to want to watch all of it. So enjoy and feel free to, you know, send me an email with all your thoughts and comments as you watch it, because I love these discussions. Um, my kind of history and why I'm here is that I am a very cross-disciplinary person. I've gone back and forth between being a software engineer, building tools for data scientists, and being a data scientist solving problems. Um, I've spent about the last five years up until six months ago managing software engineering teams. And about six months ago, I became a software engineer again. And what I've been working on is adaptive experimentation. You can think of this as like multi-arm bandits and sequentially optimal experimental design. Um, lots of interesting things sort of going on in that space in the world right now, uh, generative AI being related to one of them. And one of the things that comes to mind when I get asked like, okay, like what's a classic problem you could solve with something data science-y, I would do something pretty simple. I think with, I would take the Rumpelstiltskin problem, right? So one of the core tensions there is Rumpelstiltskin says he will help someone if they can guess his name. And I think there's enough really sketchy eth ethically data aggregators that exist in the world, data brokers, that you could absolutely lure Rumpelstiltskin into providing his name or with a little bit of information, figure out what it, what his name is. Uh, so sometimes data science is just about having better data than fancy models. Appreciate that. You'll get a lot of emails from us. Um, next we have Sam. Yes, I love that, Juliet. Um, and Gabriella, your example is super great too. Um, I'm Sam. So this is my second career. My first career, uh, I was an environmental scientist. So I have graduate degrees in toxicology risk assessment and public policy. I had a successful consulting career for the U.S. government, worked for the EPA for a long time, had my own business, then worked for RTI International before um, making the jump into data science, I would say, in 2014. Um, in 2016, I went to Amazon, and so I went to Amazon into their sustainability group and to work on carbon accounting. Data was the problem. They did, weren't really ready for a data scientist, and so um, it got to a point where we needed to build a credential management system, and I was like, guys, not the person you need. Um, and so I, I moved over to Alexa and worked as a research scientist in Alexa for several years, had an awesome time, worked on the skills team where we had developers building skills, consumers using skills, got really found my love of product data scientist uh, in that role, building models that were deployed on devices. Um, was there for quite a while, then followed a favorite manager over to AWS, where um, led kind of the beginning of experimentation over there. We used to say AWS printed money, but now we know Azure <laughs> has come in and is a great competitor. Uh, and that's no longer true. So we had to get better about how we were spending our money. Dropped into Microsoft right at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. Um, and that has been a whirlwind here at Microsoft. So I spent the last five years kind of coming from Amazon and then over here as a tech lead really um, enjoying that type of role. And it's only been within the last year that I've become a manager. Um, 
But in doing that over in Office, my team focuses on a lot of, of the horizontals in Office. So co-pilot, causal inference, um, collaboration, things like that, graph um, network. That, that's the kind of things that my team uh, works on. So my real world or um, kind of fictional problem this is spoilers, so if you're watching The Last of Us and you haven't seen the end of it, I will put a thumbs up, I will put my thumb up when I'm done with this spoiler, okay? Um, you've been warned. Okay, so Ellie, who's one of the two main characters, she is a young teenage girl, and she has this immunity to cordyceps, which is this fungus that has created a post-apocalyptic world by infecting human hosts. It's, you know, she represents the first hope in like 20 years of developing a treatment or, or prevention for cordyceps infections. And she finally gets to a safe hospital. So we've got like the government and then we've got the resistance going on. If you know, you know, if you don't, it's fine. And she's not even there 24 hours and like, we're gonna kill her and take her brain out. Cause that's the only way we can save humanity. And I am like, so many problems with this, okay? So for starters, okay, I don't even think they have the infrastructure to like maintain a fridge system to keep these tissue samples stable for any amount of time to do any sort of testing or development. That's number one. Why not focus on, okay, Ellie's doing great. She's alive, we keep feeding her, we protect her. Her brain tissue is not gonna go away. It's still gonna be there. Let's try to get an MRI up and running, okay, guys? Um, that's where I would start. What about some blood samples, okay? Maybe we want to actually, like, make a safe testing environment with cordyceps where we know we're not going to get people infected. We can do some testing, all of this. Um, you know, just, just maybe at least, like, let's keep her alive a little bit longer to generate some data to inform this whole decision-making process. So, like... Maybe killing her and taking her brain out is the only way to stop cordyceps. But the risk reward matrix that we have right now is definitely not at a place where I would even go to Ellie and say, hey, I want it like the, I know you want to save humanity. This is what I think we need to do and let her decide, which, by the way, in the show, they don't even do that. They just like, we're going to kill her. We're going to tell her everything's going to be fine. She'll see Joel when she wakes up. Everything will be great. They don't even tell her that. They just like off to surgery okay so my key takeaways here data generation is critical you need to know how your data is created we make enough assumptions when we go into modeling we do not want to be making assumptions on the foundations on the data that we're actually building off of number two when we are working with data that re that relates to humans in any way and users are people ethical issues are always going to be there so that was my icebreaker thank you thank you oh thumbs up i'm done with spoilers thumb up yes so with that let's get dive right into all the questions we collected from our community members before this event so for the first question we want to hear from all three of you the question is, with the ever-changing tech landscape in data science and machine learning, how can data scientists stay updated and decide where to focus when trying to further their technical skills? Let's start from Gabriela. Yeah, great, great question. And it's so hard to keep up to date. And it's like always this catch-up game where we are trying to uh, learn the new technical skills that it seems that it's going to be needed uh, for your work. And I always say, start with the, the, the minimum that you need. Like what, what, what are the things that the companies ask the most? Like don't go anything very fancy right now. Like the majority of the companies, we are still doing like the whole data, the data, data acquisition, data querying, filtering, cleaning the data, data exploration, uh, creating reports. Uh, so my, my suggestion is always to start with that piece because it's like a cross. No matter where you go, there is data, hopefully, and you are going to somehow uh, need the skills to manipulate the data. Of course, when you go to companies that are more mature, per se, probably will go to the next level, uh, if you will, if you are lucky, right? You are going to be doing more like the glamorous type of work where Julia does and maybe Samantha where like you do some modeling and you put your model into production. It's all like the, the fancy stuff. But I would say a, a great 
bulk of your work is like dealing with data? How do you make sense of and get, get insights from the data that you have? Next, we have Sam. Um, yes, agree with everything Gabriella just said. Data is foundational, being able to get it from where it's generated, aggregated in a meaningful way, all that is super important. And so I just kind of want to call out where I think we are within our field. We're in this period of specialization. So data science has been this like generic bucket of like everything. Um, and even like five years ago, I feel like data engineering wasn't valued in the same way. Like I don't, maybe it was starting to exist, but it definitely wasn't valued the way it is now. Um, and so as AI has moved forward, the separation that I'm starting to see is like these applied scientists who are really building and deploying product AI models at scale. Data scientists really kind of still in that like big broad bucket, but a little bit more targeted at like business and strategy solutions and research scientists. So I work with a lot of people in MSR. It's one of my passions. And they're really working on those new ML algorithms. Um, so the universal skill across all of these different variations is the ability to learn, okay? And the ability to, to find something that's interesting and pick up a new skill. That is always going to be your superpower as a data scientist. Um, my recommendation is pick one thing per year, per quarter. I don't know what your cadence is. I don't know what your what it is, but it needs to be interesting to you. And my other recommendation is something that you can use in practice. For me, I learn by doing. And so I can attend a course and it's great. I will have retained none of it if I didn't actually go back and do something with it, uh, with what I learned. So those are kind of um, the two big ones. Maybe it's a training. Last year I did a training on DevOps because I was super interested and we had some ML off stuff coming up and I wanted to learn about that. Um, the other one here, is watch out for the anxiety monster, imposter syndrome, that feeling of not being good enough and overwhelmed by all the things you don't know. And guess what? You're never going to know it all. And neither is anybody else. And this is a really beautiful thing because it makes you better able to work with other people and see the value that they bring to what you can do. Um, so really pick one thing at a time. Make sure it's interesting. Um, and that you can put it to use. Good. I love how you do the summary of your own talking track at the end, help people summarize. So Julia, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I hear two questions in there. One is the, how do you stay on top of all of the changes that are happening across a huge selection of fields? And the other is how do you choose your focus? And so I think it's impossible to stay on top of everything. So I'm going to start with a question of how do you choose your focus? And I'm going to, you know, people are at different stages of their career, but I'm going to sort of target this at, you know, you have a solid baseline, you understand how to contribute in some kind of broad way, and you've worked on a few projects, and now you're, you're thinking like, okay, how do I begin to continue to develop these skills in different ways, right? Um, I the way that I have approached this, and I'm the type of person that has kind of optimized for some amount of breadth while getting good at building products and, and being a software engineer, is picking that like T-shaped distribution of your skills, right? Where it's like you want to have some breadth and you want to be strong at something so that you can come into a project and immediately contribute. So beginning to understand your own career motivations, what you enjoy spending your time on, and figuring out what jobs map to how you actually enjoy spending your day-to-day -day work time, I think is quite important. Once you understand what that is, either you're currently doing that job or there's some kind of gap, right? And so beginning to think about how do you begin to close that gap? What are the other skills or things that you need? And then looping into, okay, like what is, how do I, how can I stay on, inf on top of information that is in this field? How can I begin to practice with it? Um, an example that I have right now is I want to learn more about reinforcement learning, how that overlaps to CE systems, bandits, like these are all similar concepts with subtle differences and people use these words in different ways and it's kind of broad. And so one of my approaches is both 
keeping an RSS feed that I just sort of like see what people are talking about. If something's interesting, I'll read it. And that's kind of a, I would call that a passive engagement model of like, okay, like information kind of streams past you and you read it a bit. I think there's the slightly more active learning model where I will, for example, get summary papers or like overview papers that people have written on areas, read over those, but in the like active mathematical reading sense, um, I find that I need to really write and take notes and handwritten notes in order to understand a, something well. And you don't understand something well until you can explain it simply. And so one of the things that can be really nice is if you have a seminar, for example, where people share things they're working on, um, we kind of have, so in Netflix, we have two causal inference seminars. One is a more structured, like here's research that we have done and different causal inference methods as applies to our, apply to our business context. And then there's another one that's a bit more loose. It's like, I'm thinking about this thing. And so I have signed up to, to give a like overview of Bayesian optimization to that seminar. Am I an expert? Like, eh, not really, but I would like to be. And by preparing to present that information, that gets me closer. And then I think there's the third component of like, okay, well, if you want to continue building on skill, you've like learned about something, you want to actually apply it and use it. Having an understanding of like your own skill set, where you want to be communicating that with your manager, they'll keep an eye out for opportunities for you. You can keep an eye out for opportunities for you. You can either find that in your own like fun self projects or at work. And so I think those are just kind of the the different levels of staying on top of and figuring out how to like drive your attention and energy. Thank you so much. So many good advice here. I resonate with everything you just said. And now that brings us to the second question. What impact do the recent announcement in generative AI have on data science careers? And what changes should data scientists make? This time let's start from Sam. Okay. Um... So this builds heavily off of what I, I just said, um, which is like, I kind of see that data science Uber skill as being able to learn. Um, and so think about generative AI as a learning accelerator. Want to learn a new language? Ask ChatGPT to uh, translate your existing code. Note, do not use your actual work code. Pretend it's Stack Overflow and you need to create a reproducible example and then have ChatGPT um, translate that. Or do some prompt engineering and say, hey, ChatGPT, write this in Python, write this in R, write this in Scala, all of that. So I think that it really kind of like unlocks some of that um, pain that comes with learning a new new coding language um, or learning how to do something that that you might not know that really is um, founded in 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 a language. The other the next one is um, look for product opportunities. So I've been really lucky sitting on managing a horizontal team in office <laughs> during this and then Copilot happening. But Copilot's not it. Like there's tons of product opportunities that generative AI um, can offer. And so that's the other place is look for where there's opportunities um, in the product. The third thing and final thing here is looking at the patterns, look for patterns based on the reality of generative AI. So LLMs are expensive to run, okay? Trying to sort out what's hype and novelty um, from what's actually going to be useful and likely to persist, that's going to be really valuable um, in this space. And you're only going to figure that out by playing with it and seeing like, hey, I've got a task um, that I think Ch chat GPT or image generation or what, whatever that generative AI that you're going to look at, try it and just be in that mode of playing with it because it's so new, there's so many opportunities and nobody knows what all of them are. You know, Copilot's easy. It's just kind of like, yes, okay. Um, but there's a lot more out there. So those were kind of the, the three points. Use it to learn, look for product opportunities and then play with it to really see like what's gonna stick around and what's just kind of novelty and hype. Thank you for your advice. 
And next we have Gabriela. Anything you want to share? Yeah, and I love Sam your points, and I see it as a learning tool as well. And and like the co-pilot, it's like a co-pilot, like driving with us in this journey, helping us facilitate and to remove some of the blockers that we have. And um, I don't think we'll replace the work that we do. Um, I think will be another thing that we use in our day to day. Of course, if you think about all the tools that we as a data scientist, we, we had previously and it was a new, a new thing back then. Like even if you think about ID and ID, like ID was a big revolution, uh, revolutionary thing for us data scientists and, and for the general, I think, audience where we had something that was friendlier, uh, easier to use. Like, of course, Generative AI, it's bigger, has a, like a bigger impact. There is a lot of like responsibility and problems also. Uh, but I see it as a tool that we can leverage to do things even better in a way if we do responsibly um, and use with cautious. Um, and uh, the other piece is like it's unblocking. Like if you are learning a new skill, a new language, you can, you have no idea how to start. You can go to that job. ChatGPT, for example, or go to GitHub Copilot, and it helps you navigate. But again, it's like you have to have some kind of like uh, idea that not everything that it's the 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 prompt is giving you is correct. So don't take that as like the the total truth. Um, I, I go back and forth between, for example, one of those tools and a book, because I know that the book there is a lot a lot of revision. So I'm, I'm even though I use this new uh, technologies. I also rely on the old school technologies to make sure that what they are giving me makes sense or not. Um, so again, it's like something that will help us and especially around learning and unblocking uh, things. Thank you. Next, we have a question for Sam. So oftentimes there is a debate between what model performance that meets the business expectations versus how to further improve the model, which can exceed the expectation. How to decide where's the sweet spot to pause model development? Okay, I, I wanted to address this. I kind of have two approaches here. Um, the first is from my point of view, always better to under promise and over deliver. So if this means do your best to scope and size the work for the requirements that you're given, if you're bad at this or you're just human and you suffer from the planning fallacy and optimism bias, take that estimate and multiply it by pi. OK, that gives you the time you need to understand your data, build your model, stress test it on edge cases and set up monitoring. Then and only then, if you have time left over, do you think about improving performance? Other way I think about this is to parse model the model project into two phases. So you still I would still do the pi, the, the estimate and multiply by pi. Um, but you take a first phase and you you choose to focus specifically on the business problem and interpretability. You start off and you say, I am only going to use really simple model structures. I love regression. I love logistic regression, and you're going to focus on delivering something that can be shared upwards through the business, then people are going to talk about it and they are going to have an understanding of what you're doing. And you're going to go hands down and you're going to say, now I care about performance and I'm going to try a bunch of different model structures and try to try to bump that performance. And so I think you've already kind of delivered something that gives the business some understanding and then you're a little more free to go black box or complex methods. Um, so that was kind of my, my two cents on that one. Thank you. And given many of you have experience being managers, ICs, um, next question goes to Juliet and Sam. How can data science managers balance maintaining technical skills while focusing on leadership and management responsibilities? Juliet, would like to hear your thoughts on it. My my take is that managers have a different type of technical leadership responsibility. And so you don't want to get it in your head that like, okay, I need to keep all of my skills up, right? That said, 
I think if you have a goal as a manager to be an IC again, or you see a world where you're like on the manager IC pendulum and kind of want to go back and forth, then you should keep that in mind. But that's separate from your management responsibilities. That's your own personal development, right? So it's going to keep, I think it's good to frame it that way. When I think about the technical skills you need to keep up as a manager, I think it is more about increasing, not maintaining the skills that you had as an ISD, but increasing your ability to take business context and translate that into context that your team can understand how it impacts their jobs. So asking yourself, like, what do I know about business performance, the direction that we're going, changes we're, we're going to face, things that are happening in the next year or five years, um, and how can I set up that context so teams and people on my team understand how that impacts the specific things they're working on. And so I would work on improving those types of skills, which are actually much more important for managers. Sam, what's your take? I love that. Um, thank you, Juliet. That that piece about like the management skill set is different and framing problems business problems as data science and modeling problems, that is a skill that we really grow into through our careers. And that is one that is, is hugely important. So I love that you brought that up. Um, I'm a relatively new manager, so that this is about one year in. Prior to this, the, the leadership that I did was much more mentorship, tech leadership, growing people who wanted to engage with me. So. Where I'm at is I'm still doing pair programming with my direct reports because I like to write code. Um, I share code that I've written. I've had a couple folks make them move from R to Python this year and I have notebooks. And so I sit down with them and I actually, we have an hour long session and we work on translate and they see me use Stack Overflow, <laughs> okay? And we, you know, going forward, we will, we try. So we had FHL, we had some internal chat GBT endpoints that we could play with um, as well. But like, I really enjoy that. And I'm at a stage where I'm not, as a seasoned manager that this has fallen off yet. Um, we also do code review and my data scientists and applied scientists, we do data engineering code review. So we are all present for that and data science code review. And so that is another way where I just kind of see that um, hands-on still, I find it incredibly um, rewarding. It's actually relaxing <laughs> for me. Um, to, to have some of that, like seeing code in front of me. I also, um, piggybacking on what Juliet said, thinking about it as your professional development trainings, I will actually look for things that are interesting. So I think I shared, I did DevOps, like a three-day DevOps training where we actually built a project as a, as a group. And then I brought that back to like how we think about ML ops for my team as a whole. But again, that's my my personal development, not necessarily. And it was, again, my belief that you, if you're doing something and learning something, you should apply it because that's how it sticks for me, was that I brought it back to my broader team and kind of, this is how I think we should think about ML ops um, and, and, and moving for things forward like that. So, yeah. Thank you, thank you. And now we're living in an era where there's no lack of bad news every day. There's banks going bankrupt, there's layoffs, there's the macroeconomy not doing great. Um, so Gabriella, do you have any thoughts on how can managers generate energy for their team during such uncertainty time? Yeah, I would say like try to control the things that you can control, like layoffs are like, kind of like out of our control right now. And even if you look at the data and layoffs that are happening, it's kind of like, in a way, I think it's random. I don't see like, oh, this person was laid off because they were a poor performance performance person. Uh, though I don't see that. So try to do the things that you can control. So make sure that you, you do your work, that you are building your network internally and externally, building your eminence, again, internally and externally. Do the best you can. Don't also like, and no matter in which times we live in, it's like, don't kill yourself for your work. Like, Make sure that you do other things as well so you balance, uh, especially right now. And try not to go through this spiral that we can go through like, 
you know, there are so many different outlets and websites that you can go. And there is a speculation of like, oh, the next company that will lay off a lot of people is X. And then you're like, oh my goodness, it's tomorrow. It's tomorrow my day, it's tomorrow my day. Like you in this anxiety uh, mode all the time. So like, this is out of your control. Do the best you can, do the best job you can, build your network internally and externally. Uh, so that's what I try to, to tell my team is like, you know, we are here, we are doing the best we can make sure to have a balance between your work here, your outside life as well. Take care of yourself. Thank you. So we know a lot of uh, community members in the in our WITS community are not necessarily having a data scientist title. Some of them are software engineers, data engineers, program managers, marketing, all different disciplines wanting to transition into data science. Juliet, we know you have a very diverse background in your career. So what are some of your suggestions on how can a data engineer transition into a data scientist role? Yeah, I my general take is that the first data science role is the hardest one to get to actually get the role that has that title. Um, I have while well, well, I have done a bunch of different jobs, my transition into data science was kind of immediate because I studied applied math in grad school, right? And so I think that there is something really beneficial about being able to have your own educational time carved off to learn foundational mathematical skills. Like no one thinks linear algebra or numerical linear algebra is really like cool and awesome until suddenly you need it all the time in your job. And it, but I think that's just the reality of it. And so I think it depends on what style of data scientist you want to be and what it is that you want to learn. But if you want to become a data scientist, and this is like maybe non-traditional advice, I would say like carve off some time to make sure that you learn your foundational mathematical skills, because that is going to be people's biggest questions coming into it. And maybe it's not, you know, going back to grad school. Maybe it is doing an online course or a self-taught, self-paced course that you have found the materials for online, that's fine. Um, but I think putting that investment into mathematical foundations is good, is quite important if you're coming from a non-traditional background. If you're coming from a traditional background where you have like a, a statistics PhD in causal inference, like it's actually relatively simple, right? Um, so I think that's one component. And then the second component is actually beginning to do the applied portion of it because the applied portion is very different than the mathematical foundations. And that's something that has, I think, a lot more advice for online where, you know, get practical examples, work on open data sets, see what kind of interesting um, systems or inferences or analytics you can produce and then show and use that as your, your portfolio. So there's maybe two components there. Thank you. And on that note, there are also community members who ask, should a data scientist who hasn't worked in a specific data science domain apply for a position that requires knowledge in that domain? If so, how to be competitive there? So Julia, do you want to start? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the the answer is always know your worth and know what your skill set is that you're bringing, right? I think the best position for you and a company for any role is one where you're delivering something valuable and useful based on your skill set and can do that immediately and simultaneously are challenged in learning something new. And so if you have a skill set that's valuable and can translate across into the field, then emphasize that, that you will be able to immediately help people do something. And in the meantime, you'll begin to learn and fill in other areas and become even more useful. And so I would sort of think about it and frame it that way. Thank you. Gabriela, you have any thoughts? Yeah, and the other piece is like, as you change jobs, is your opportunity to learn. So you learn a new domain. And it's always interesting to come with no knowledge at all. Of course, a lot of work that it needs to be done. Like let's say you have no knowledge around the advertisement industry. And there is a lot of like terminology and acronyms that they use that you have to learn. It's like almost learn a sec learning a second language because you have to communicate using those terms. Uh, but it's also like opportunity for you to understand what is this domain, if you like that domain or not. So I don't see 
I see, actually, I see us as data scientists, we are flexible enough to navigate uh, different domains because we have other skills that are very important to the business. Uh, so I don't see that you are less competitive because you don't have those domains. I see the other way. You come with fresh eyes, with fresh perspectives, and probably with fresh questions that no one asked before because they were so like, you know, uh, deep into this world that you as a newer, a new person uh, has a different perspective. And Sam, I thought you have some thoughts to share here as well. Yeah, really just echoing what um, Gabriella just said, you know, that fresh perspective is really an asset. You, your ability to ask those questions, groupthink is real. And so like you can sometimes drive some awesome change just by asking a question that you're like, might be afraid to ask, but it really can like stop that group thinking its track and they're like, what? yeah, so it can be an asset and just think about survival curves and churn, <laughs> like coming from a toxicologist. Um, that's what this field is. It's taking learnings from other fields and applying them in new ways. So go for it. Yeah. Sounds good. And then we have the last question from the pre-collected sessions. Um, that is, what are some key factors that impact a woman's ability to lead others effectively? So Sam. Okay, so I'm sitting from an incredible place of privilege as I talk to you about this. I'm a second generation woman leader in tech, okay? I learned a ton watching my mom. She worked at the Digital Equipment Corporation in the 80s and 90s when they missed the PC revolution. She started out in network engineering and continued to get promoted until they um, asked her to step up um, and bring to central engineering what she'd done for network engineering. The entire process was so painful, she quit two months after her big promo and opened a consignment furniture store. Key takeaway here is there's nothing inside you preventing you from succeeding. The environment around you will always be your biggest challenge. And I wish I was sitting here and could tell you that things had materially changed from the 80s and 90s, but this is 2020 data. Women hold more jobs than men. Men still hold 91% of the executive board seats. Tech is still not where it needs to be with only 61% of those tech companies in this survey. I can send you the link if you want it, having at least one woman on the exec board. Only 19% of tech directors are women and only 5% are women of color, okay? So there's a few things to look out for here. There are some women stuck in a fixed mindset where they, they think that there's only so many spots at the top and they're not gonna act as your ally. Often this is at a subconscious level. These women have no idea that they're doing it. What we need to do is practice self-awareness so that we don't fall into this pattern. Um, you need to be direct when issues arrive. A very common example we hear about. If you're being talked over by someone habitually, you need to speak to that person directly in a one-to-one -one and raise your concerns. Ask them to act as an amplify ally and help amplify your voice. Some people are just not going to do it, but at least you met it head on and you made them uncomfortable for at least a small amount of time because you're feeling that all the time. Um, and some people are actually going to listen to you and they're going to start working to support you. Um, the, I think this is my final one. Sorry, I have notes. This is not my final one. Let action speak louder than words. Work with people who demonstrate the ability to actively listen. This is such a critical skill. If you're in an interview and that hiring manager doesn't actively listen to what you're saying, it's not going to be a good place for you. Work with people who champion you to others and invite you into the room. It is hard enough. Set yourself up for success by working with people who demonstrate, not spit, say, how much they respect and value you. Ignore the chatter. Watch the behavior. The final thing, don't fall into the sunk cost fallacy. Don't be afraid to move to something new. Be strategic. It took my mother 18 months of planning before she left tech and started her first business. That store is still in business 20, 30 years later. She sold it and she's had multiple other entrepreneurial endeavors that she's done. Um, this is where your learning superpower comes into play. You don't have to gut react. You can be strategic. 
but you don't have to stay in a place where you're not valued, supported, and respected. That's all I got. Thank you. It's very impressive. So now we're uh, we're done with all the pre-collected questions that we got from our community members, and we're moving to the open Q and A session. If you have not yet, please uh, submit your questions in the Q and A part in the Teams chat, um, and we'll ask our speakers. So for now, we have a question from Taiwan. Um, how did you overcome the challenges switching career and industry? I believe this is a question for Sam, and Gabriel also has some insights to share. Um. So <laughs> back in the day, before I had children, I had a lot of time on my hands and my husband and I um, took a Python class together um, to build video games because he loves video games. I really liked statistical programming and I was hitting some geospatial analysis capacity issues with MATLAB and R. And I knew that Python would solve that for me. So um, we just, did it together. It was fun. We built a bunch of video games and then I was able to take my MATLAB code and make it run in Python. And it made me super happy um, because at the time I had more time to go to the gym and play with my dogs because everything was just automated and I wasn't fighting MATLAB anymore. So that was one of the things was like, there's a skill. Um, I also, again, sitting from a place of privilege, my mom had been in tech, my brother was in tech. Um, and so I would kind of talk to him and be like, oh, my God, it'd be super nice to be like a data scientist in big tech. Ha ha ha. Um, and then it just kind of like took three years to kind of have that vision and then like take some classes, take a job with an, a data scientist title, demonstrate, like get a marketing budget so that I could build shiny apps and go to conferences and, and present those. Um, that's the type of things that I did. And then Amazon called me specifically because I had that environmental science expertise for the carbon work. And so it was as Juliet brought up, like getting that first job that's in, if it's big tech or if it's in the new area with the title, that was um, kind of what kind of clinched it. Um, and then from there, just seeing an opportunity in Alexa and being like, I have value to add here. Um, look at all these things I've done. Um, and that was enough to go over there. So just being curious, following interest, learning, 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 <laughs> um, and then applying and, and kind of like slowly building that portfolio. Now, if you have kids, do not, do not build things outside of work. Like do very, like, how can I do something that proves value in the role I have? Um, you know, people are in different life stages. So I don't want anyone to walk out of this and be like, oh my God, I've got to go and do all this stuff. I'm like, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Just be curious, learn something and apply it and build your portfolio that way. Nice. Cool. I can share a little bit and, if, and it will build on top of what you said, Sam. Um, so before moving to the industry, I was in academia. So I was doing research inside a lab, inside the university. So very theoretical in a way. Well, some application, of course, because it was epidemiology. So I was working with uh, epidemiology, more specifically on public health and air pollution. Um and then I was there for a few years and then I moved to the industry and, and I always uh, get asked this question, how different or how similar or what are some of the, like the changes that you had to make or to overcome from coming to, from academia to the industry? And there are two things that I always, it was a struggle for me. One of them is timing. Because in academia, we had like a year to write a paper, two years, I don't even know, to do some kind of like research. Um, so we had a, the whole time, of course, it's not like a whole time, but it's a lot of time compared to the industry, where industry is very fast paced. And it doesn't need to be the best. It just needs to be good enough. Is this model 0.00.1% better? Yes. Great production. Right. So it's like the, the timing, it's very different. You need something for like tomorrow. It's like all, all the time, like changing. Uh, so the, the fast pace was was definitely something 
um, that I noticed. The second, the second uh, big piece was around uh, not being the best, but good enough. And, and us like thinking of like, oh, it doesn't need to be the best. Gabriela, don't like overwork or don't, you don't need to do more than this. This is good enough. Go and deliver this. And it was a, it was a battle for me because I was like, no, this is not good enough. I should do more and more and more. And my, my boss was like, no, that's good enough. Stop. We need to deliver. So it, it was kind of like a very different mindset that I had to uh, incorporate in my, in my job. And of course, the first job, as we all know, the first job is the hardest. Like how do you uh, revamp your resume in a way that it's going to be acceptable uh, for an uh, uh, industry job to look at, at your resume. So that's the other piece. But I, I, I shared a little bit because I know that a lot of people are coming from academia and moving to the industry. Thank you. And Juliet, what's your thought on this? Yeah, you know, I think that in any transition, it's useful to have a mentor who you work with and can actually give you some feedback on how you're doing, things that you're working on. So, I mean, for me, in my first transition from grad school into my first software engineering job, I had kind of two mentors. One was a guy that I worked with who was like, going to teach me how to do engineering stuff. And we pair programmed a lot. We did a lot. He did a lot of code reviews for me. It was incredibly helpful. And having that type of working dynamic where you're free to learn and like just really collaborate with someone is really helpful. So I think that one, that is one incredibly useful aspect. And then I also had a mentor who I was connected with, who's, she's like at YouTube now. I think she's worked at Google slash YouTube for the last 20 plus years, almost however long Google has been around. She's one of the first 300 employees. She's like one level below Jeff Dean at this point. And I was introduced to her. It's like, hey, you should like meet Lexi and just talk with her. And it was great to have that um, technical woman's perspective. I'm a little bleak to hear her perspective sometimes, but wonderful. And I think that, um, you know, just coming with that learning attitude and picking picking your role and picking your environment based on what is the role you're going to be able to learn the most in, what is the company or the team that has the most supportive for learning environment that will actually help you get up to speed in that first transition, I think is pretty crucial. Um, yeah. Great. And then we have two um, questions that are both relevant to self-learning, which goes along the lines with what you were talking about earlier, but I think people are looking for more detailed answers. Um, one is about how do you keep up to date with industry trends, Twitter, podcasts, newsletters, blogs, or anything else? And the second question is on um, how do you balance self-learning time after work hours with day-to-day -day activities? Wants to share first. I can, I can go first. Uh, I do use social media a lot, like Twitter um, is especially around some of the topics. Uh, I've been very inserted in the art community. So if I want to know what is happening in the art community, Twitter is the place that I go to. Uh, but following some people that they do share interesting stuff is, is also like a place that I, where it's how I approach. Also the RSS feeds that Juliet was mentioning. I also have my RSS. Uh, there are some outlets like News uh, Y Combinator. I think that's how, it, how it's called. It's another place that I go to. Uh, so I try to filter some of like those outlets to tailor the, the, the things that I'm looking for as information. And then the second question, there was a follow-up, sorry. And how do you balance self-learning, right? Uh, I need to carve out time during my work hours. It's almost impossible to have time after work, especially uh, as Sam was saying with family, kids, and all uh, the duties, like the second job that we have to perform with, with family. And the other things, self-care and all of that. So I try to carve, carve time during my work hours to do self-learning. It can be like on a Fridays where we have last meetings and then I have a, a block of interrupted time that I can learn. Thank you. And with only one minute left, we're going to go wrap up with uh, closing thoughts. And to be consistent, we started with an icebreaker question from ChatGPT, and the ending question is also from ChatGPT. The question is, what is the biggest misconception that people have about data science or data scientists? We'll start from Juliet. 
I I kind of love the term data scientist because people can project any skill set that is useful th to them onto it. And so it's so vague that people are like, ah, yes, you can solve my problems. And honestly, that's handy for me. Thank you. Sam? I think this is more from like hearing from other data scientists is this idea that we know all the methods. So it's kind of like with Juliet, but I think it kind of like creates some of this like anxiety. And I, I really, I felt that earlier in my career. And at this point in my career, I'm really trying to get people to embrace complementary skill sets because having multiple perspectives and multiple people like informing that is so powerful you're always going to do something like bigger and better than you could just do on your own and so that that's i think the thing that i i you cannot know every method it's impossible and so as soon as you can embrace that hey i know what i know and somebody else knows what they know and together we are going to be able to do things neither one of us could do without the other person Next, we have Gabriella. Yeah, I'll go back to my my previous point where you're probably going to be doing something more basic than the, the AI that you are thinking that you are going to be doing when you move to data science or doing modeling, like that you are putting model into productions and all like the fancy stuff that I call the, the glamorous stuff that people think, oh, I'm creating these new models that are running production, it's live. Um, but the, re the reality, there is a lot of like foundation work that it needs to be done. It's important, as important as the other piece. Uh, so that's that's one of the misconceptions. It's like you are going to be doing some dirty work. It's not going to be as glamorous, but it's going to be fun. Yes, I can totally resonate with that. So with that, we're at the end of the time. Thank you so much, Juliet, Sam, and Gabriela for spending the time with us today and sharing all of your fantastic insights, career journeys with our community members. And thank you everybody in the attendance today to spend for spending time with us and hearing all these panelist discussions. Please fill out the survey that, that's shared earlier in the chat to help us provide better contents and better events for you in the future. Thank you very much. Have a nice rest of your day.